chapter 42, The Law Repeated. This chapter is based on Deuteronomy 4 to chapter 6 and chapter 28. The Lord announced to Moses that the appointed time for the possession of Canaan was at hand. And as the aged prophet stood upon the heights overlooking the river Jordan and the promised land, he gazed with deep interest upon the inheritance of his people. Would it be possible that the sentence pronounced against him for his sin at Kadesh might be revoked? With deep earnestness he pleaded, O Lord God, Thou hast begun to show Thy servant Thy greatness and Thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to Thy works and according to Thy might? I pray Thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain, and Lebanon. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 24 to 27. The answer was, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. Without a murmur, Moses submitted to the decree of God. And now his great anxiety was for Israel. Who would feel the interest for their welfare that he had felt? From a full heart he poured forth the prayer, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Numbers chapter 27, verses 16 and 17. The Lord hearkened to the prayer of his servant, and the answer came, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight, and thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the people of Israel may be obedient. Verses 18 to 20. Joshua had long attended Moses, and being a man of wisdom, ability, and faith, he was chosen to succeed him. Through the laying on of hands by Moses, accompanied by a most impressive charge, Joshua was solemnly set apart as the leader of Israel. He was also admitted to a present share in the government. The words of the Lord concerning Joshua came through Moses to the congregation, He shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him, after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Verses 21 to 23. Before relinquishing his position as the visible leader of Israel, Moses was directed to rehearse to them the history of their deliverance from Egypt and their journeyings in the wilderness, and also to recapitulate the law spoken from Sinai. When the law was given, but few of the present congregation were old enough to comprehend the awful solemnity of the occasion. As they were soon to pass over Jordan, and take possession of the promised land, God would present before them the claims of His law, and enjoin upon them obedience as the condition of prosperity. Moses stood before the people to repeat his last warnings and admonitions. His face was illumined with a holy light. His hair was white with age, but his form was erect. His countenance expressed the unabated vigor of health and his eye was clear and undimmed. It was an important occasion, and with deep feeling he portrayed the love and mercy of their almighty protector. Ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard, and live? 
Or hath God assayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation, by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know therefore that Jehovah thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 to 9. The people of Israel had been ready to ascribe their troubles to Moses. But now their suspicions that he was controlled by pride, ambition, or selfishness were removed, and they listened with confidence to his words. Moses faithfully set before them their errors and the transgressions of their fathers. They had often felt impatient and rebellious because of their long wandering in the wilderness. But the Lord had not been chargeable with this delay in possessing Canaan. He was more grieved than they, because he could not bring them into immediate possession of the promised land, and thus display before all nations his mighty power in the deliverance of his people. With their distrust of God, with their pride and unbelief, they had not been prepared to enter Canaan. They would in no way represent that people whose God is the Lord, for they did not bear his character of purity, goodness, and benevolence. Had their fathers yielded in faith to the direction of God, being governed by his judgments and walking in his ordinances, they would long before have been settled in Canaan, a prosperous, holy, happy people. Their delay to enter the goodly land dishonored God and detracted from his glory in the sight of surrounding nations. Moses, who understood the character and value of the law of God, assured the people that no other nation had such wise, righteous, and merciful rules as had been given to the Hebrews. Behold, he said, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Moses called their attention to the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. And he challenged the Hebrew host, What nation is there so great? Who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day. Today the challenge to Israel might be repeated. The laws which God gave his ancient people were wiser, better, and more humane than those of the most civilized nations of the earth. The laws of the nations bear marks of the infirmities and passions of the unrenewed heart, but God's law bears the stamp of the divine. The Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, declared Moses, to be unto him a people of inheritance. The land which they were soon to enter, and which was to be theirs on condition of obedience to the law of God, was thus described to them. And how must these words have moved the hearts of Israel, as they remembered that he, who so glowingly pictured the blessings of the goodly land, had been, through their sin, shut out from sharing the inheritance of his people. The Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, not as the land of Egypt, from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seed, and waterest it with thy foot, as a garden of herbs, 
but the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley and vines, and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 to 9. Chapter 11, verses 10 to 12. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. If they should do evil in the sight of the Lord, then, said Moses, ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. After the public rehearsal of the law, Moses completed the work of writing all the laws, the statutes, and the judgments which God had given him, and all the regulations concerning the sacrificial system. The book containing these were placed in charge of the proper officers, and was for safekeeping deposited in the side of the ark. Still the great leader was filled with fear that the people would depart from God. In a most sublime and thrilling address, he set before them the blessings that would be theirs on condition of obedience, and the curses that would follow upon transgression. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. But it shall come to pass... If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee, and thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations whither the Lord shall lead thee. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even! And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning! For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. By the spirit of inspiration, looking far down the ages, Moses pictured the terrible scenes of Israel's final overthrow as a nation, and the destruction of Jerusalem by the armies of Rome. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, 
which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. The utter wasting of the land and the horrible suffering of the people during the siege of Jerusalem under Titus, centuries later, were vividly portrayed. He shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest, throughout all thy land. Thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straitness, wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her children which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straitness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. Moses closed with these impressive words, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. The more deeply to impress these truths upon all minds, the great leader embodied them in sacred verse. This song was not only historical, but prophetic. While it recounted the wonderful dealings of God with his people in the past, it also foreshadowed the great events of the future, the final victory of the faithful, when Christ shall come the second time in power and glory. The people were directed to commit to memory this poetic history, and to teach it to their children and children's children. It was to be chanted by the congregation when they assembled for worship, and to be repeated by the people as they went about their daily labors. It was the duty of parents to so impress these words upon the susceptible minds of their children that they might never be forgotten. Since the Israelites were to be, in a special sense, the guardians and keepers of God's law, the significance of its precepts and the importance of obedience were especially to be impressed upon them, and through them upon their children and children's children. The Lord commanded concerning his statutes, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates. When their children should ask in time to come, What mean the testimonies, and the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then the parents were to repeat the history of God's gracious dealings with them, how the Lord had wrought for their deliverance, that they might obey his law, and to declare to them, The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us.